Our scripture reading this morning, for those of you who haven't memorized it, comes from the fifth chapter of Matthew. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Ancient words from our traditions for our present day consideration. Thank you all for being here. Well, I saw a poll <coughs> the other day. <coughs> Excuse me, that might be helpful. I think there are two things right now calling themselves the Christian church. One of them wants power, wants to control the political process. Uh, the other is just trying to love and serve and help. I think this has always been the case, but I don't think most Christians realize how low we've set the bar. There was a poll that was released that I think Christians need to listen to. First, they asked Christians what they thought of themselves. 57% of Christians summarized their, their faith as giving followed by compassionate, that's 56%, loving with 55%, and respectful at 50%. But, but then when they asked non-religious people what were the qualities that they associated with Christianity, 55% of those identifying as non-religious responded with judgmental, followed by hypocritical at 54%, self-righteous at 50%, and arrogant at 36%. So we need an inquisition. <laughs> no, just kidding, just, just kidding. My whole life, when I've ever seen religion on television, I just am embarrassed. If you look at religious on television, you never see anyone who's teaching what Jesus taught. I mean, I'm sure there's some that I miss, but when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, it's a whole different game. I think sectarian Christian separates people, judges people, um, and I think there's a deeper level of understanding that actually unites us with other religions and other people that aren't even religious, but it's a level of love and compassion. I believe that's what Jesus was teaching. We're looking at the Sermon on the Mount, particularly the verse where Jesus said, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. And I think we need to ask, first of all, is that true? Are, are the merciful people that you know necessarily getting uh, mercy back? Is that good advice? for somebody who's in an abusive relationship? Is it good advice for somebody who lives in an unjust culture? There's a tension between mercy and justice, but I think Jesus thought of them as aspects of one something. And I've heard it said, seek justice, but love mercy. Never forget that by you know, a purely righteous standard, we would all probably be in trouble. If there were a helmet that we could put on our head 
And it would show what our secret thoughts were. How many of y'all would put that on? <laughs> Feel good about it. Probably not a one of us. And the one, anybody who would do that would probably be so boring, you wouldn't you know, really want to <laughs> see the tapes of it. It's really hard to be human. And none of us do it perfectly. So at the same time, we're looking for a better world. We're looking for justice. I think Jesus is saying we have to remember compassion too, mercy. Is that good advice if somebody is in a relationship with a creep? What I believe Jesus is saying is that He's come to teach love, but because we are so frail and get frightened so easily and get lost in our ideas or just in selfishness, just trying to survive, we get tired, we get overcome, that we also need to have mercy for ourselves and for each other. That sometimes we all do something that's beyond forgiveness. And at that point, people are more important than the rules. The three things that occurred to me as I look at, at this passage this week is one is that I think that being merciful is blessed because it's self-love. Think of the pain that you carry when you can't forgive. And I think we all find ourselves there. Those nights when you're laying awake at night and somebody's stupid face is right, you're looking in your mind's eye. And you're taking what they said the day before and you're playing it over and over again. And you're lifting up the inflection. And they said it one way, and by now you're going, e -e 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 -e. <laughs> computer enhanced. <laughs> it's human nature, right? but we can carry resentments so long that we forget we're carrying them. And I think that's part of what Jesus is trying to say. That if we cannot forgive, we cannot love. At some point, there's a short circuit there. And it's hard for all of us, but I think Jesus is saying, if you want to be a happy person, then you need to be a loving person and if you're going to be a loving person, sometimes you just have to let it go. The word for forgiveness means to cut off, just to drop it. Let it go. So when there's somebody who you feel has hurt you, first of all, you make sure you're safe, right? This is not saying to stay in abusive relationships. It's not saying to ignore the danger that might, somebody might be for somebody else. But take care of your own heart and realize that bitterness is wounding you. The other person probably is not even aware that you're up at night stewing on it. They're probably sleeping really good. <laughs> so mercy means sometimes just letting go of the things that are hurting us. Not because we care about the other person, but because we don't want self-abuse to take place. And sometimes your brain will do that. Your brain will pump out the most painful memories if you get embarrassed, it'll, it'll play back every film of the time that you made a fool of yourself. If you did something wrong, it's got that on file. It'll just keep pumping it out. So to be a loving person, we have to be able to let go of that, which means we have to separate the need for justice, which is also very important. The need to not be abused or to let somebody else get abused. So we have to deal with those things, but we also don't want to lose the humanity that's there underneath. Sometimes that's not possible. That's why we're in community, because none of us can do this perfectly. But to realize that your joy and your happiness is going to be stronger and better if you don't get trapped in bitterness. If you don't allow anybody in your life to turn off that light, that you were made by love for love. 
But sometimes we get stuck and somebody else can turn that off. And we get trapped in a storm that we really don't want to be in. Your love is strong enough if you can let go of that other person. Your happiness will be more constant. The second thing I get from what Jesus is saying is, is mercy is blessed because it's good for the world. Let's say, and this is going to be impossible, imagine that I do something creepy. <laughs> Unforgivable. And you come up with the perfect line to make me feel like dirt. All right, we've been there. A lot of times you'll think of it later and you think, oh, if I only thought of that, I could have really wounded that person. And that's not really what you want either. But we just get lost in the pain sometimes. But ask yourself, what is better for the world? To wound somebody and let them go? Or to live in a way that heals the world? If I'm a creep, and that's an if, it's an if. <laughs> you don't want your calling and ministry to the world to be shut down so you can get at me. You don't want your righteous anger at me to shut down your compassion for everyone else. Sometimes we can get so mad at somebody else we get tunnel vision. And we say that perfect thing that hurts them. And when we realize that a lot of the stuff that's really bad is really coming from fear, from disappointment. If we can realize that, then we won't want to wound them further. We may want to avoid them. We, we may want to do what it takes to be safe and be healthy and happy and keep them from hurting somebody else. But all in all, the more we can love, the more love there'll be in the world. Let's look at... Uh, this is Psalm 103, and one of the things when you read something by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, look up if he's quoting somebody. Because he was being much more radical than it seems. Remember, they were occupied country. You criticize Rome, you die. You criticize the establishment of your own culture that's sold out to Rome, you die. So Jesus is going to go through and he's going to quote these things, but if you look them up, he talks about the love of God and stuff. But he says, how you love justice, you are always on the side of the oppressed. Those four letters that you're seeing are really, really important. If you're reading in Hebrew, that's the divine name. You didn't say it. You replaced, uh, with a, you replaced that with another word. That's what the English translation has, is, is the other word. What Jesus is talking about here is your contact with the source of your own being. You may not find the concept of God convincing. You don't have to, but you need to know your roots that go down into life and into nature. You need to feel your connections with other beings. That's a symbol of something that Moses heard in the burning bush. I think it's in every bush. It's that raw being. It's, it's the, the, uh, a form of the word to be in Hebrew. So he goes on like that. Let's go to the next one. You are tender and compassionate, Holy One, slow to anger and always loving. Your indignation doesn't endure forever, and your anger lasts only for a short time. This was quoted to talk about mercy. A lot. What you can't see in English, and it's one of my favorite uh, things I learned in seminary, was that the thing slow to anger. <coughs> in Hebrew, they would talk about anger that your face got hot. They're talking about that feeling of anger. Very visceral, very poetic. Your face got hot. If your nose was long, 
that meant it took longer for your face to heat up. So literally, this is saying, God, you are long of nose. <laughs> it's poetry. It becomes absurd when we take it literally. Absurd is poetry. But God does have a long nose, so don't make fun of it. because. <laughs> so this is in the background. When Jesus is talking, and the Jewish people are going to hear it and understand it, and the Romans are going to be oblivious to it. How you treat other people affects the world. And because you want a better world, you want to treat people well, even as, when it doesn't seem in your best interest. Again, that's not saying put up with abuse. It's not saying ignore injustice. But it's what Jesus, what uh, Martin Luther King was talking about when he said, hate cannot cast out hate. Only love can do that. First he said, darkness cannot cast out darkness. Only light can do that. Then he said, hate cannot cast out hate. He was actually quoting Buddha. I, I highly suspect he took some Buddhist stuff to, to prison. But he couldn't say that in the United States. Um, but it's a very powerful, deep spiritual truth that no matter how angry we are, darkness cannot cast out darkness. It's better to shine your light. We live in a time where people are calling each other names. There's a very powerful political movement in our country that bases itself on calling people names. It has no real policies. It's all about hating people who are different. It was like that in Jesus' time. So that's our choice. Love or hate. Call people names. Remember Jesus said, when you call somebody a fool, you're already on your way to hell. He's, it's, po it's poetry, it's, it's figurative. I wouldn't be here today if I thought there were a torture chamber underneath my feet. But I, I wouldn't be trying to get you to like God if God were a torturer. Hell is a description of what life feels like sometimes when we lose love, when we lose our interconnectedness. If you think about it, you've never seen a happy bigot. They may be successful, they may be powerful, but they're certainly not as happy as they could be The closest they'll ever get to humor is ridicule. Think how sad that is. The closest thing they'll get to patriotism is hating people on the other side of a line. How sad is that? The closest thing to self-esteem they'll ever know is thinking they're better than somebody else. That's tragic. Someone like that is already in hell. And there's no amount of punishment that can make hell worse. We can't fight the kinds of evil that come from fear, that come from despair, depression. We have to heal those. And it's not only our love of the world, but it's like recognizing that every one of us falls into that same pit from time to time. And we think something unforgivable, we do something unforgivable, we feel something unforgivable, but we have to let it go. And to realize you've got a planet full of people like that. Um, in Moby Dick, I like this. Herman L. Melville said something about Presbyterians. He says, heaven have mercy on us all, Presbyterians and pagans alike, for we all somehow, we are all somehow dreadfully cracked about the head and sadly need mending. <laughs> How can he say that about Presbyterians? <laughs> When Jesus is on the cross, he looks at him and says, 
They know not what they do. That's so frustrating. But it's so freaking true. When we do evil, we're lost. We're hurting. We're in despair. It doesn't justify it. It doesn't excuse it. It doesn't mean that you don't have to fight against that. But to not lose that sense of the human being on the other side. When you try to enter in this kind of love, the worst mistake you can make is to start with the hardest examples first. Hitler's always first, right? If I showed mercy to Hitler, okay, that's probably true. Somebody that abused you, somebody that used you. But what about some family member who you can't let something go? If you picture that person in a cradle, and you think about the little child, the little baby, what happened to turn them into a creep? If you learn that story, it's different, is it not? If you picture them in their casket, and you're, you're walking by at their funeral, that changes it, does it not? I mean, every one of us is going to die which makes every one of us precious. It doesn't make us safe. It doesn't mean we can, we can ignore somebody else hurting somebody else. But can we realize that there's a human being on the other side of that equation? Carl Sagan. <clears throat> I love when atheists say it better than Christians. Every one of us is, in the cosmic perspective, precious. If a human disagrees with you, let them live. In a hundred billion galaxies, you will not find another. Again, that sense of, of wonderment. That's how Jesus looked at us. Our happiness depends on being able to look at each other that way and not let somebody else's imperfections rob us of that condition of love. I suspect the happiest you've ever been, maybe you fell in love, maybe you were in a, in a forest and you felt everything interconnected. You're falling in love with this person over here, but the birds, right? And everybody you met on the street was transformed. Probably the relationship didn't work, but that's not the point. The point is the rapture of recognizing the interconnectedness of all being. It's the happiest joy we can know. And to not let somebody who's confused or just creepy, don't let them rob you of your own light and your own love. I think that's what Jesus is trying to share with us when he says this, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy, that when I can have that mercy for you, I can have it for myself. If I'm sitting in judgment of you, I will probably use that same scale on myself. I may not be aware of it, but I'll sit there and pat, pat myself to death by the same standard. So there comes a moment just to let it go. Let it go because it hurts. Cut it off. Not because you're Jesus, but because you don't want to hurt. You love yourself. Cut it off, you let it go, not because you're perfect, because you care about the world. And you know that hating back only brings more hatred in the world. And then finally, you love the creep because you realize <coughs> there's no such thing as a happy bigot. If you stop thinking of hell as punishment and think of it as what it feels like not to love, it's what you're missing. It's not what happens to you, but it's what you're unable to enjoy about life that Jesus is warning you about when he talks about hell. I want to close with a letter that I found online, so it's got to be true. <laughs> it's it's a, a kind of a poem thing. It's a letter <coughs> from somebody's guardian angel. Dear child, sometimes on your travel through hell, 
You meet people that think they are in heaven because of their cleverness and ability to get away with things. Travel past them because they don't understand who they have become and never will. These type of people feel justified in revenge and will never learn mercy or forgiveness because they live by comparison. I hope angels are nicer than this. This is a little mean. But listen to this. He warns they would rather put out your light than find their own. They would rather put out your light than find their own. They don't have the ability to see beyond the false sense of happiness they get from destroying others. You know what happiness is, and it isn't this. Don't see their success as their deliverance. It is a mask of vindication which has no audience other than their own kind. And again, I, I would want to say this nicer. But Angel says, you are not like them. You are not meant to stay in hell and follow their belief system. You are bound for greatness. You were born to help them by leading. Rise up and be the light home. You were given the gift to see the truth. They will have an army of people that are like them and you're going to feel alone. However, your family in heaven stands beside you now. They are your strength and as countless as the stars. It is time to let go. Love your guardian angel. Well, that's all I got. Uh, so we're gonna take a moment for you to think about the wisdom that you bring to this text. <laughs>